Welcome to the Embracing Organics live show. Hope everybody's having a beautiful night. And they had a great winter solstice. I mean, not winter, spring solstice, the equinox, full moon, the good stuff. What the panel? Everybody doing tonight? We got Magley Fit. How you doing? How you got, how's everybody doing? Where's Dan? What's going on? Where's Dirtman Dan? And yes, if you haven't noticed, Dirtman Dan is not joining us tonight. He says he has a he has a hurt head. Dirt man's mangina hurts. Yeah. Or he just doesn't love you guys. That's what it probably is. <laughs> just kidding, guys. He loves you. But we got uh, Pumador on the panel tonight. Cheers, guys. What's up? <clears throat> What's going on? Hopefully we'll fill in for Dan. Right. Won't even keep notice. it going. No dead air. Just That's right. Keep it flow. Then uh, old Stabby over there join us. What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Each and every one of you who tunes in. Each um, and every one. Each and every one. I think about you every night. But uh, no, there's uh, there's some definitely interesting things to talk about. Um, I'm really glad we have uh, Matthew on the show tonight. I've been thinking about IPM all day, and I didn't even know he was coming on. See, that's kind of what's nice about scheduling them out a couple weeks and when you're able to get them on tonight, Stabby. Matthew, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your Instagram, YouTube, and like you, what you do, a little bit about your background, you know, kind of your education, things like that? Well, he yeah. does do it. I do want to say, I do want to say real fast. It is 710. Yeah, All right. Go ahead, Matthew. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. That's an, that's that is an important thing to note. Um, yeah. So I'm my name is Matthew Gates, and I am a person who loves to educate people about and be a science communicator about things like what you just mentioned, integrated pest management or IPM. Um, so I I went to school. I went to SDSU. Um, for horticultural science, although actually, fun fact, I was planning on joining the U.S. Army and I wanted to go into military intelligence, uh, uh, but I realized that my my passion in life probably would not be um, fulfilled <laughs> if I did that, um, but I made a lot of good friends and I learned a lot about myself and other people and and things like that, so I'm very glad I made the, uh, the, the fortunate decision not to... Uh, go that route um so now I've, I've i've kind of followed you for a little while on youtube and not many people really know that you've been on youtube how long have you been on youtube you know i've been on i've been making videos on and off on youtube for a while now i think it's like four or five years um but you know i have actually been not putting the effort that i have been um, until about the last two and a half, I would say, really, um, in, a, in a way that's like focused and congruous with my Instagram and other social media and my, and my professional work. Now, Instagram wise, you go by a different name. What's your Instagram? Yeah. Um, it's, I pronounce it as sync angel. That's S Y N C H A N G E L. Now, how long have you been on Instagram? Hmm, I've been on Instagram for about three years, more or less. 
I see you got quite a bit of following on Instagram so far. Yeah, I didn't expect myself to, you know, it's funny with, with uh, I'm pretty accepting of like new technologies and new ways to communicate and things like that. But um, I never thought I would be somebody who would be popular on Instagram at all. Um, but, you know, my perspective about Instagram was, is that stereotyp uh, stereotypical impression of like vapid, like, you know, kind of moronic people who just take pictures of their phone of their food and like put filters on everything and those people exist but it's actually been a pretty cool force for Dude, I'm right here <laughs> right here I was just gonna well, say I took talk about pictures about me of like my flowers and just, like, <laughs> them down in color the room. filters and shit too yeah exactly yeah, way to way to punch down, Matt. <laughs> no, um, that that exists, but I've actually well, I wouldn't have met all of all of you fine folks if I hadn't like gone on Instagram and met a whole bunch of other really cool science minded people. So really, honestly, I think that that stereotype is maybe like at least only partially true. I want to introduce Seven Ten real quick. Uh, he jumped in. Hey, 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 everybody. How's it going? How's it going? And, of course, I can't hear him, so I'll be right back. You can't hear me? Uh, can anybody else hear me? I can oh, no, hear him. It's not, it's not you, okay. Seven Ten. It's him. All right. Uh, it's well, Medfit. He's I'm glad everybody else can hear me. Challenge tonight. <laughs> I wonder how many times Seven Ten has heard that. It's not you. It's me. It's not you. It's me. <laughs> can I have you spell that IG account again? I'm having trouble finding it. Yeah, I put it on the um. I just texted it. I just saw that on the on the um group chat. Uh huh. Yeah, okay, I can be able to post it here in the chat for everybody to see. I I appreciate that. So Matthew, uh, talk a little bit about some of like the posts you post, both video wise on YouTube and your Instagram. Like, you post quite a bit about different pests, aphids, mites, um, different types of management for them. Can you kind of explain some of that? Sure. Um, I've actually had a hard time. I also have a Patreon account, uh, shameless plug, if people want to support me monetarily for the research that I do. I'll always make free content, though. I do want to make that really abundantly clear, that I'm, I'm a big, big advocate of... Um, of, of, of free exchange of information and I, I understand that there is such things as proprietary information and I don't begrudge people for that kind of a thing but I do also think it's really important if you're going to do that to do a lot of other pro bono stuff so you kind of balance it out anyways um, that's actually kind of a nice segue I've had a hard time kind of coming up with a uh, a good like succinct description of what kinds of things that I talk about but I would probably say that the best way to put it is it's all to do with like uh, phytopathology or like plant, you know, plant health kind of. Um, but I also talk and make videos about like insect physiology and whether they're pests or not, um, uh, you know, ecology, environmental sorts of um, topics, you know, it all kind of. When you talk about a holistic system like integrated pest management, it all kind of bleeds together, and it's very hard to sort of talk about one thing in isolation. I mean, you can, but then you're not getting the whole picture. You know what I mean? Right. There's a lot of, like, secondary metabolites that come into play. There's a lot of different hormones that come into play. Like, some of these people um, – that's what we try to, you know, discuss a little bit to help break some of it down for them, almost in a simple terminology. Um, are you able to do some of that for uh, a lot of our guests? Absolutely. Okay. So, like, um, uh, like in a specific, like, path? Uh, not to interrupt you again, but Tanazi, if you present my screen real quick like if you click yeah. on me since you're the host and present me um i've are. got his his yeah, ig pulled up screen, and right? i can just uh sh okay i wasn't sure um but i've got some of his recent posts on here and you can see his all his uh tip jar information and everything real quick just in case you want to donate to him go ahead That's i'm awesome. sorry oh yeah. no I, I actually appreciate that 
kind of talk about like how a plant um, fends off pests naturally. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a that's definitely a topic people like to to talk about. And boy, is it complex. But I'll I'll break it down really simply. Um, so so plants plants have a thing called an, an innate immune system. Uh, humans and vertebrates and other sorts of things have like what I like to call um, immune system 2.0. So plants have 1.0 and we have 2.0 and we have what's called an adaptive immune system. That doesn't mean that plants don't adapt. It just means that like, unlike plants, we have cells that like move around our body, like white blood cells and things, and they go out and attack. Um, Plants don't have like something that's innately part of their body that does that. Um, Instead, they outsource to fungi and bacteria and all kinds of other things that I'm sure all of you are aware of. And microbes, that's where microbes come in. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, so do Nabby, can I ask? Uh, oh, go ahead. What are you pulling up there? I was just going over some of his posts as he was talking. Um, like it's it's really interesting the things that he he's talking about because I am by no means an expert. I am a hobbyist uh, with a passion at best, and I I use practices that some people shun, some people shake their head at, and you know like. It's just kind of what, like my own style sort of that I've developed. And um, I use like a diverse microbial population. And I also use a diverse um, uh, insect population too. Like I've got all sorts of predator mites and uh, mantis and uh, ladybugs. You, you name, Like everything that... Um, I'm not like too crazy worried about getting out of the garden. I'll I'll throw in there, you know, like here's a shot of a couple of my mantis having a party. <laughs> That's pretty cool, actually. <clears throat> now, as home growers, and we're trying to fight off like spider mites or broad mites or aphids. What are some of the better recommendations that you could, or that you would recommend for us to try? Um, instead of using like different harsh chemicals on our plants. Hmm. So it's context. So I'm always, I'm going to say this a lot. So, or maybe I can just like make a, a general statement. Um, it's always going to be context dependent. I, I love saying that not because it's a catch all that saves people's butts, but also because it's just true. Like the recommendation that somebody would make for like an outdoor grow is going to be different than indoor grow. And you're talking about a place where in and even in the space where you're where you're home growing, you know, there's still like, you know, different different ways of doing that. Um, but as far as uh, recommendations in general, like for example, uh, instead of using poisonous, noxious chemicals, you can use, like you mentioned, biocontrol agents, right? So like predatory mites. Um, so it is surprising to me. I guess it's not that surprising to me. That I also people- use a lot of compost teas, and I also use biological uh, sprays like Photosynthesis Plus. Um, I've even gotten like, uh, you know, if they were on sale, so if they were on like Black Friday sale or whatever. So I picked up uh, the whole BioWar line, including mm. their foliar spray, which uh, there's some people who have uh, some questions about the the viability of that and how many, you know, active uh, colonies there are in, in that powder. But, you know, uh, that's a debate that goes into how they do their testing and everything and what the, the heat shock that they do. And, you know, that's, that's a whole nother conversation. But in a way it's also not right because it's definitely related to, all of it, right? Um, and microbes, I find it fascinating. I am, I am definitely not somebody. I don't think there's really, and maybe this is contentious, but I don't think that really there's there's so much bleeding edge information that's coming out every day, every week, every year. You know, like it's very hard to keep up on all of it. Um, you know, and, and but it is important, uh, and uh, not to wax like. Not to get, I'll be very, very simple about this. Like, you know, it shouldn't be a very controversial statement to say that, like, plants, you know, 
you know, the wild versions of what we cultivate now existed in X geographic location, right? And developed there probably for literally millions of years before humans came along and tried to cultivate them. And then, you know, they had this relationship with microbes, but over time, traveling, uh, you know, cultivating plants in a specific way, um, away from their, their normal geography, away from the insects and the fungi and the microbes that they exist with, we've kind of over, over millennia um, bred out some of that, uh, some of the genetic uh, um, factors when it comes to interacting with those microbes. Um, because, you know, people back in the back in the day, they didn't know what that was. They didn't even know what genes were. Right. So Absolutely. you can't fault them for it, but it's what happened. Hey, Matthew. Uh, cheers, 710, cheers. what's your take on some of this? Oh, I'm I'm right with him. He's uh, I got no I got nothing negative to say about that. That's all uh, dead on. That's well, yeah, they used I to mean, think that like miasma caused illnesses and stuff. Right, like that. <laughs> man. <laughs> The, like you yeah, can look at like you can look at somebody people. the wrong way and give them the evil eye, right? Yeah, that used to be a, that used to be disease, treating people's insanity. But yeah, like the practices that I personally use in my garden, like I've gone full no-till at this point, and what I try to do is use beneficial microbes to just outcompete everything, and I use them in a rotation. So like I'm uh, like every week I'm using a different microbial based tea or something and adding it to my garden to try to outcompete any pathogen pathogens or anything like that that's gonna uh, get in there and cause any uh, harm to to what I'm trying to produce. I think that's really important, and that research is so important, but so hard because like in a vacuum a microbe population might act one way and then you know in a community with other microbes they'll act totally different so it can be very very frustrating to really parse out whether something is actually going to be beneficial in the field but that's true of like yeah it's totally trial and error at this point to see if something's actually gonna uh, you know <laughs> give me the results i want or not you know i'm just kind of yeah, as, as it goes with my name taking a stab at it Yep. <laughs> All right, Tanasi, hit that yeah, bell. Man. I got a question, though. When it's in yeah. the more cows opposed outside with that other microbes, it, how you're saying it's better, right? But when it's isolated in like a more s sterile environment, is it does it get contaminated a lot? Is there contaminations that happens amongst this? Well, what do you mean? Like fungus, like messing it up or anything, like eating, like destroying things. So how, how you were saying just a second ago, you, you're like amongst when you're isolated, it it acts differently as opposed to when it's amongst other microbes and other beneficials and bacteria. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, like here's a fun fact. Um, you, do you all you all know botrytis, right? Yep. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Isn't it like everywhere? Oh, right. Like powder oh, milk. Right. Yeah, so botrytis um, is actually a seed endophyte, which is just a fancy way of saying it's something that can exist in the seed of plants through uh, the ovaries, kind of like a sexually transmitted infection, you know. And it's got a virus, actually. There's actually a couple of viruses that, if you can believe it, infect botrytis. And one of them uh, creates makes them... Less able to infect plants, believe it or not. Which is kind of wild. Um, and so, like, to get to what you were saying about contamination, uh, yeah, absolutely, that is what can happen. Although, typically, I think what happens is that there's some sort of, like, what's called quorum sensing or, or you know, something where the microbes are communicating with each other. Or they're not even communicating, they're just, like, the, the exudates that are being produced by one population might inhibit or exacerbate certain qualities of another microbial population. And, you know, it's like one, it's like people, right? One person's complex enough, but you get two people together, you know, unless they're very simple people, like, you know, that's why relationships are hard, right? Uh, Matthew, do you feel that, what? Anything. what? 
relationships are hard? I've never heard this before. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty... I, I mean, maybe I'm just alone here, but... <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, pal. You'll find someone. What so, were you saying, Timidor? <laughs> uh, well, I don't uh, want to misrepresent, um, but yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's interesting to to I that actually goes to another thing that's not quite related, but I like to consider things from a I like to use metaphors related to the interaction between like I don't know I, I find that there's a lot of metaphorical um, similarity when it comes to like the interactions between the pests and the plants and the microbes and like people or society or that kind of a thing, but that's just being poetic. You know? Or were you trying to ask something? Oh, I was, I was trying to ask, I guess, um, I, well, we can pick one. Let's see. Uh, when you were talking earlier about the interaction between, I think you were getting to bacteria and fungus actually kind of modulating the immune system of plants because plants don't have white blood cells. They don't have, you know, T cells. They don't have any of that active, like that, those active, like soldiers that our immune systems have, that mammals have, or insects even have. So yeah. plants have to rely on something else. And I, I don't really understand that mechanism. I've heard like, I don't know, Paul Stamets and other guys talk about how fungi, I think you were just getting to that too, about how fungi can inhibit certain pathogens on their own. Uh, what could you tell us? Like, you know, we're obviously lay people, you know, none of us, I don't think, except for maybe 710, has a science background in especially microbiology. How can we integrate the interplay between bacteria, fungus, any other different microorganisms uh, directly to, to, in, to uh, increase plant health, basically, or right. to even destroy pathogens? Right. So, um, I, so one of you was talking about. A po the, the post that I've made, I actually made a post that's very related to this. If um, who is that? Who is Stabby. that? Kind of Stabby. Stabby. <laughs> we could. I didn't uh, do it. What? <laughs> there's a post that I made that's very much related to this. Very recently. Let me. Can I see my uh my? Can we put that on my page or whatever? Because can I see? Can you pull them up? Picture. Yeah. yeah. Can you see? Um. Have a stabby highlight. Just tell me which one. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't see it anymore. I mean, I scrolled like all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. Oh so. yeah. Um. This, I'm back up at the top now. Oh, it's that one. It's the picture of the um with the lake and the tree and the right below um, it. Yeah, that one. Yep. Yep. Okay. So. Basically, the long so I have a big pet peeve. I have one big pet peeve when it comes to IPM and talking about plant health, and that's the idea that like a quote unquote a sufficiently healthy plant can't be like infested or infected mm. or any of that stuff. It's simply well, I believe not, that it just makes it more resilient. Not it that it's immune, yeah. but that a healthier plant with a better cell structure, you know, with more silica and calcium in, in it is going to be less susceptible to pests and pathogens and, you know, fungi and powder mildews and shit like that. But also, like, just being in the soil with microbes, fungi, <clears throat> bacteria, you're, you're influencing it with uh, some abiotic stresses, and that's, that's going to... Yeah, you've got, like, this cohesive technique. relationship going on. Well, it's it's kind of like if you get a cold and you start producing more white blood cells, but plants that like like we were talking about there, plants don't have white blood cells. So they've got to produce these secondary metabolites like uh, salicylic acid for one. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's exact. That's a really good way to put it, right? So um, that's how that's how I would put it. It's that it's just that it's a different system, um, and this particular post kind of talks about how like. Uh, you know, plant the the evolution of land plant from from algae, like like millions of years ago. Um, nice. You know, and how and how like plants have been under the threat of pathogens since before they were land plants. So yeah. so like the so the uh, immune system, you know, there's a founder effect, right? The the founder effect being like if you're if you have a if you have like a bug, let's say you have like a bird and it flies across the ocean uh but it you know it gets tired and it, it lands on an island right it's like the galapagos islands 
kind of a thing, right? So, so the the genetics, the genome of the of the few populate of the few individuals that form a population on an island is going to greatly influence how that population develops, right? So, in the same way, um, plants, the first land plants. The common ancestor of uh, of dicots and mono or monocots and dicots, but also you know, the an the angiospermae and the the gymnospermae, right? All of those, you know, um, they had a simple shared immune system, and then that kind of you know it, it uh, diverged as they evolved. You can um, even go further back to like uh, like warts and uh, and moss. Yeah. And it just builds that's that's like your that's your 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 step one right like that that first plant that's on land it has to be in a wet spot it it pretty much has to be submerged but it can be dry every now and then and then it evolves something else a little bit thicker of a cuticle it's allowed to now it can stay out of water a little longer uh generations 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 okay now it can stay out of the water for weeks at a time and just as long as it has a full supply of water at all times you know like, yeah, no, that's a, exactly that's kind of what I'm getting at, right? And yeah. so, so, and there's also things called um, susceptibility genes. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not like they're called that because we call them that, right? But they're just genes that pathogens exploit. Um, and if the plant doesn't have that gene, it actually can't be. In some cases, it, it's immune to the pathogen, effectively immune, uh, unless it like perhaps it gets into a wound, maybe, or it's like literally just not able to uh, infect the plant nearly as well as it could, um, you know, and that kind of co-evolution between a pathogen and its host plant or host plants, right? Like with powdery mildew, uh, for example, um, there's a really interesting research report that talks about how Quercus or like oaks, um, if I'm getting, if I'm, I hope that I'm uh, remembering my genus right. But um, that the oaks, I believe, were considered to be maybe very fundamental to the um, development and then uh, of powdery mildew and then to Asteraceae or like a kind of like your um, your uh, composite flowers like sunflowers and and daisies and things like that. And then it kind of branched out from there, or at least the generalists did. Um, so like and, that and kind of evolutionary, that sort of co-evolution is important to consider. Absolutely. Yeah, I always thought susceptibility genes came off after like four or five drinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. I like that. <laughs> so uh, just a little bit ago, you were talking about how you don't think, I kind of agree with you, by the way, that you don't think that plants can be completely and totally uh, um, resistant to pests and pathogens, even when they're healthy. Uh, there's this new like plant health pyramid that people have been talking about. Uh, I don't know how new it is, but anyway, they were talking about it on the Dude Grow Show the other day. And it's been around forward, for a year or so. Yeah, it's like at the bottom, it's you know photosystems, just the basic needs. If you can visualize the basic five or six needs of an organism, you know, at the basic food and safety, and at the very top, you could have whatever your mental creativity. And so it's the same thing with the plant. At the very top, once you've fulfilled all those needs, the plant can uh, at the very top maximize the creation of terpenes and flavonoids and all that kind of stuff and if any of those fundamental under pyramid steps are compromised then the rest of the pyramid above it is going to be compromised too so anyway they were talking about the do grow show that if you uh, have that perfectly healthy plant you're never going to have any uh, pest issues and i agree that you're probably not going to have many but i'm wondering what's the actual mechanism between like you know so many people say this the plants never going to get healthy or never going to get sick. Well, if I drop a million aphids in that room, are you still going to swear that that plant's not going to get sick? And yeah, what a what ridiculous asking, like, premise, right? What's like, that? Go ahead. Like, well, no, I, I don't mean to interrupt because you're, no, totally go, go. you're totally on track as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, what a, what a ridiculous premise that is to me. Like, not to be super bold or anything, but like, like I, you know, like I, 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 I've thought to myself, like, why don't we just have this, like, um, you know, I have a vial of, of, of serum of this virus. <laughs> like, all right, we'll bet. All right, if you think your plant... Now, first of all, people never define what perfectly healthy even means. Like, I feel like that's a really vague term in, mm. in general. Um, and also, you can, you can also have the opposite effect, where you can pump a plant full of nitrogen, 
and you've got aphids. There's very good um, <laughs> research that shows that like aphids, if they have a highly nitrogenous host plant, they will reproduce faster. As well um, as uh, spider mites too. Yes, it was. Exactly. Read a, a post about right, that, exactly. a post a journal, a journal paper about that. And that's the kind of thing where sometimes you can. It's like having a. It's like having too much sugar in your bloodstream, perhaps. So you know, kind kind of. It's not the same thing exactly, but um, there's this thing. Have you all heard of a of a Liebig's law of the minimum? Mm, yep. Yeah, it's like a barrel that the the. The lowest slat, basically, the water leaks out of that slat. So if you have too little nitrogen or too little boron or whatever else, you're going to basically leak out of that barrel and never fill the barrel. Exactly. I mean, that's the that's the um, the old uh, uh, diagram, but ex that's exactly right. So like, uh, in that way, I agree with the pure, the idea of like a of a like a like I'm not going to say don't keep your plants healthy um, and don't keep your plants uh, uh, feeling good. And I guess what I mean is that again, it's sort of contextual. Um, what that even means and what is even like, like, first of all, from a species to species basis, but then also like for what you're trying to do. Like if you're a vintner and you're growing grapes for wine, you know, you're going to grow your grapes different than you're going to grow somebody else or some other uh, uh, plant, or you're going to grow your grapes different than a different grape grower who maybe is just going to make grape juice, you know, um, and different cultivars might have specific needs. So, I don't know. It just seems like a really, again, vague term. Now, Matthew, are there a couple different type of systems, not just a salicylic uh, system, but isn't there like a jaws, what is it? Jasmonic uh, acid. Jasmonic acid, yep. Can you talk about that a little bit too and what the difference between them are? Not uh, not with too much detail, but I can a little bit. Um, they, basically, those those pathways are part of, like we were saying, uh, there's part of the, the plant physiology uh, for immune response. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty conserved in a lot of land plants, both of those pathways. And, but how, how they kind of uh, activate and how they can be manipulated by, by pests and pathogens, um, but also how they can be manipulated by other plants fungi, both beneficial and sort of neutral even, uh, and other sort of uh, microbes. Um, you know, it's, it's just there's myriad ways that this can happen. But those two pathways usually, like uh, one of you mentioned, um, uh, uh, it affects the, the production of secondary metabolites, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then and a bunch of other things, uh, you know, like hormones, for example, in plants in general, like, you know, just like hormones with with animals, like a little bit of a hormone in the right place at the right time does something, and a lot of the hormone in the same exact place at the same exact time will do something completely different. So, um, it's very much like a, it's bimodal. It is um, it can change between two extremes or even multiple extremes. Seven ten. What were you trying to say on some of that? Oh, I was just, uh, just talking about these the metabolic pathways and how it's. Uh... Well, from what I from what I know, uh, the jasmonic jasmonic acid is a signaling uh, hormone. Basically, um, if and this is just what I was I've been taught. If if uh, if the leaf is actually being eaten, it'll go through the jasmonic pathway, which will then stimulate uh, ethyl the salicylic salicylic acid and uh, oh jeez, cannot remember the word right now. It's ethyl ethylene. 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 Another yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the plant. Yep. yeah, thylene. So that that'll that'll signal that, and that'll start filling up into that specific leaf. Um, and those also that the jasmonic acid is also a signaler to other plants in the area. Generally, there's I mean there's plants that can hear it, and then there's plants that can't. Like they're kind of there's, there's plants that have hearing towards other plants, and then there's plants that are deaf to other plants. They're they're signaling. Um, and yeah, you can. You can test that in a lab. It's it's pretty interesting. It's kind of ironic that we humans actually really kind of enjoy those um, those kind of plant cries for help, right? Like when you chop yeah. up rosemary or basil or you know rip it up on a right. salad, it smells wonderful. But it's actually yeah. like plant horror, right? It's like oh my god, we're dying. It's it's there. I totally agree with that. I mean, I know that that's sort of a lot of people. A lot of people do say that, but I I I totally agree. I think that's very funny, and I'm sure that there is. Uh, 
there's probably a reason. Like we know animals, there are many animals that we now know they they self they like self medicate uh, by consuming certain um, compounds from plants. Obviously, really simple example that's oh, yeah. kind of related to what Deer you're. And elk and stuff love magic mushrooms. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No. That's a great. That's a great example. Um, I think there's some, the stone um, ape theory. There is the stone ape theory. There's also a. Uh, I think there's some monkeys that rub um, like a millipede. I think I saw on like on a, on a documentary, and I guess like the 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 compound that it secretes. I don't remember if it like has like a. a, a like a debilitating effect or like a sort of an intoxicating effect, or if it was more for like defense, like it keeps ants off of them or something, but that's kind of cool to consider, you know? Mm -hmm. Now I have a question. Um, the <clears throat> secondary metabolites, they kind of help produce the terpenes and flavonoids. Now yeah, I have also metabolites actually. What's that? Terpenes. Uh, so terpenes, uh, cannabinoids, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all that stuff. Anything that, that isn't directly related to uh, the plants like living day to day is uh, considered basically a secondary metabolite. So, you know, the sugars are, are a primary metabolite because they, they so need sugar to live, right? Yeah. But, yeah. So what I was trying to get into is like terpenes are secondary metabolites, but they're also used in a sense for the plant as a pest preventative. Now, is that true, or is that just kind yeah. of what people are it's, talking about? Not it's only true. a pest, not only a pest, yeah, sorry, I don't want to step on your, your toes. No, you're not, go ahead. No, please, please, please. Not only a pest preventative, but, like, sometimes th there's there's certain plants that, uh, if they're being eaten by a, by a certain bug, they can they can sense the uh, the type of saliva basically that's that's attacking them it's called a uh, pattern uh pathogen associated molecular patterns or pamps for short if you want to get funky with it pamps uh so they basically they can sense that like say there's um, a saliva from a grasshopper and it's eating it's eating the leaf so then then they have two routes they can take which is the sy systemic uh, acquired resistance so that's constantly active and then there's the uh uh, uh, induce systemic resistance, which is the uh, basically when you, when you have the pathways, when something gets signaled, and then you then you start producing secondary metabolites, and that can be for you know like light, uh, UV light. We get the uh, trichomes and uh, different other secondary metabolites. Should I keep going? <laughs> of course. No, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, with, but let's be specific. Let's, let's isn't, start, it, isn't it only like and talk about the UV that you need? to uh, stimulate those uh, those traits and stuff? No, it's, it's just one thing. Like uh, there's there's so, like we were talking about how, how the, uh, there's abiotic stress or biotic stress, like microbes or something eating the leaves, that's a biotic stress. Then there's abiotic stress, which is the, you know, light around you, the, the weather, the temperature, all of that, all of that. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm saying for like indoor growers, a lot of indoor growers, well, at least ones who are growing with LEDs, they don't have uh, UV in the light. Yeah, like, it's not it's not necessary. But if you have more UV, you will produce more secondary metabolites for protecting against uh, like uh, carotenoids. That's one uh, one secondary metabolite. Uh, it's basically a, a sunscreen. Yeah, and that's and maybe the key. You might not produce product. more, you'll produce different. You'll produce different yeah. metabolites. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a certain well that you're you're pulling from, right? So if you're if you're producing all these uh, these carotenoids, you're and I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain if uh, acetylcholine is involved in carotenoids, but acetylcholine is involved with THC synthesis. So say you're pulling uh, acetylcholine to to build carotenoids. Uh, and because you have UV lighting, heavy UV lighting, you're pulling from this pool of acetylcholine that could be going to THC or CBD th synthesis. Right. It's uh, there's a physiological cost associated with the uh, production of them. That's why, I mean, of course, this is why the plants aren't like, um, you know, maxing out uh, SAR, you know, and ISR like all the time. Right. There's a yeah. There's a cost to that, and probably a big one. And then, oftentimes, the production of, of complex compounds are going to be that way. Yeah. Real quick, 
real quick. Dab time, Tanasi, hit that bell. <laughs> Beat me to my mic. Okay? You have to clue me in. What makes what makes it dab time? Uh, it's just it's just that time. That's all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take a dab. <laughs> we don't we don't we don't dispute hey. the dab time. You just <laughs> hey Matthew, can I ask? You just said that there is a, a high cost to maintaining those uh, basically those, those alert systems, right? It's like the constant uh, the, the, the the red siren on the aircraft carrier, or whatever. Like there's there's uh, enemies around. So when you induce that response, so these days, like, you know, growers a lot of times induce the SAR with uh, insect frass or even some of them, like, introducing pest pressure through compost or whatever else, that maximizes terpenes. But what are they losing on the back end? Do you have any idea? Do you know what I'm getting at with this question? Are they losing in uh, uh, weight or in some kind of uh, uh, physical performance or, or what, what's the drawback or is there one? Absolutely. No, there is. Yes. Um... It's opportunity cost, right? It's just the same as why, like, for humans, um, you know, if you get sick, you you kind of have to not go 100%. It's harder to go 100%. And going 100% might wreck you in some way, like, physically, um, uh, in a big way. Uh, so it's it's that kind of a thing. You just you just miss out on, perhaps, in some cases, however, it, de it definitely uh, depends on your plant and... Um, it's particular, like, uh, like the phenotype associated with its immune response. Um, uh, because you could definitely imagine a, uh, a plant that has a certain genome <clears throat> and then perhaps also the same cultivar, but, a, a, you know, a different, um, uh, individual. And it might have a genome that's slightly different where maybe it has a few genes that allows it to. Uh, maybe it's better at photosynthesis anyways, so there's less of an associated cost there with, um, like you were mentioning, with acetylcholine and um, the production of certain uh, terpenes or, um, more fundamentally, the uses of these, the activation of those pathways and keeping them kind of active rather than uh, not. Additionally, you have plants that like produce uh, poisonous compounds, and then you have insects that will eat those plants and have um, developed ways to sequester, uh, which is the <laughs> I love it. Like four stomachs in a cow, body. for example. I love it. Yeah. Preach, preach brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then of course, that's another reason why it's kind of ridiculous to say that plants that are really healthy um, are immune. Because immune means something very specific. It means that the, it, it means cannot be infected by basically. Mm. And um, sometimes uh, the uh, genetic factors that allow a plant to be immune to one disease will, in fact, make it more susceptible to another pathogen or a, different, or a particular pathotype of pathogen. So, um, kind of like in humans, when you get HIV, it's you know, it's it weakens your immune system and it makes you more. Susceptible and lowers your, you know, lowers your uh, white blood cell count, doesn't, or your T cells. Doesn't yeah, even have to know. be that. You can be like sickle cell anemia and malaria. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, bad effect. I don't know that much about back. human diseases. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're. Actually, it's, it's, it's certainly not. It's like it's not a perfect metaphor, right? But it, it totally. I think it's a great analogy. Yeah, it is like that. I think. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy with the uh, malaria specifically because. I mean, when you get a plant virus uh, or certain plant bacterium, uh, they can sometimes they can excise a piece of their DNA and slap that right into your plant's DNA. So every time your your plant makes another cell or just reproduces this DNA, it's unwittingly reproducing the virus. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or like, um, yeah, so it's like the pathogens literally evolved to not be detected and be very good at what they do, like in, this, in the case of a pathotype. So it's like, I don't know. It's, oh, dude, it's, I got a loop. I'll see him. What? What? I, yeah, I got a loop to inspect my trichomes. I'll, I'll see those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so like somebody mentioned spider mites, and you know we've mentioned them a few times. Like if you give them too much of a nitrogenous source, then they can uh, reproduce more rapidly. If you apply 
certain pesticides that are made to kill them, like imidacloprid. Not that you should ever use that on cannabis, but people use it on other plants, including cannabis, and um, it can actually cause the 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 population to be more fecund and and reproduce quicker and and more often. Thirty yeah. percent or so in some cases. Yeah, especially if they're killing the officials. Yeah, and so then also because they're super generalists and they they've been found on at least twelve hundred different plants, um, and like over two hundred crop species or or what was what did, would you even put on your um uh, yeah two hundred species over, over hundred uh, cultivated species, right? Over two hundred so species like, of plants though. So an organism. I've, I've so got, an organism. Seven uh, tens poster pulled up right now that yes. uh, he made. He cited a, some great uh, information a Sulo here. in 2000. Um, but yes, so uh, an organism that's a generalist, generally speaking, has a very um, sophisticated, like, uh, poison processing physiology. Let's put it that way. Because they, especially if the the different plants that it can feed on are like from totally different families that are really not related. And like we talked about earlier, the plant immune system has evolved from a very fundamental system to a very complex one and very variable one. So if they can really defeat the, all these different unique systems, then they are able to feed on all those plants. And spider mites in particular are very good at this. Now uh, there's a couple questions that have come up. Um, one of them, it confuses, Hi Wally said, it confuses me when I read someone commenting about powdery mildew being systemic in a plant clones. Can you kind of explain that? Right, so powdery mildew is not systemic. It's not systemically infectious. It's just everywhere, isn't it? Well, there is definitely powdery mildew spores are ubiquitous in the environment, but not all powdery mildew species infect, for example, cannabis. Um, uh, so, like, oh, yeah, like you can have species specific to uh, a yucca plant, you know, or or uh, a species specific to um, you know hemp and cannabis, or uh, like, what about the? Uh, I won't. I won't even go on the side tangent, but let's. Uh, I have got to ask yeah. you later let, about uh, let him answer tobacco that. mosaic virus. Oh yeah, because yeah. some people think that that's transferable to to cannabis, but uh, there's there's people on the other side of that argument too. So um, I might be very ignorant here, but I don't. I've never seen like an academic report that showed it, but that doesn't mean that one, it doesn't exist. Uh, or two that like new information is is coming out that would perhaps support that. I have heard people uh, ping for um, Tobama virus, so some kind of Tobama virus of which tobacco mosaic virus, which hence the name, um, uh, is part of um, in like a kit. But like that's not conclusive. You know what I mean? Um, as for powdery mildew. It's true. There are some specialist uh, powdery mildew species. A lot of them are, but um, there are also some that are generalists, but they like, so like, for example, I recently talked about uh, the genus Golovinomyces and there's Golovino, I have a video on my YouTube account, um, Xenthanol, that Golovinomyces sicoroserum. And uh, recently, a different Golovinomyces species, which I posted on my Instagram about um, uh, was also found on cannabis and reported. So, and these two species, uh, the first one, Golovinomyces sicoroserum, is known as lettuce powdery mildew. And so it infects lettuce, and now we know cannabis and also um, other plants too. Uh, so if you're growing those plants as like companions or like it's food crops or something, or if you know somebody on a different property who grows them and they're getting powdery mildew, they may be a vector to your uh, cannabis plant, which would be very unfortunate. If you look up, I can spell it for you. Please do. <laughs> yeah. So it. it's uh, G O L O uh, V I N O. Uh, M Y C E S. Uh, I was trying to cheat it. 
Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. G V I N O. Mycees. M Y C E. Yeah. Uh, so there all one word. There you go. They won't be able to hear the audio though. Oh. No, that's fine. That's fine. So here's like a map from Cabby, um, which is an international organization for pests. So this is showing where on the earth it's found. Um, here's different uh, examples of it infecting different plants like sunflower and lettuce. Um, oh, hence its name. A lot of pathogens are squash. Uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. Cucurbits. Um, I mean, I think that answers the question. Yeah, go should... check check out his uh, his YouTube channel, and, and you can hear the video for yourself instead of uh, <laughs> oh, him I, trying I guess, to recreate it live. I guess I didn't. I guess I didn't technically. Um, I didn't technically answer the question about systemic. I want to I wanna kind of touch on that a sec before we move on to a different topic if we do. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd love to talk okay. about that abroad. Yeah. So, so, so why do I say this? What's the proof? The onus, is, the onus of proof is on the person making the statement, right? So, um, Golovina, so Golovinomyces and other powdery mildews in the family Aristophiles, um, they are what are called uh, biotrophic pathogens. They are obligate biotrophs, which means that obligates mean that they need this thing. In this case, they need a host to survive. They can't live without it, which makes them kind of like parasites. Um, and in some old literature, they're referred to that way. In some new literature, they're also referred to that way, but I typically, I like the word pathogen over parasite. They, they are botrytis. Botrytis is a necrotroph. That's right. And so, and, and, and so the difference, of course, is that uh, a biotroph uh, interacts with the host first at first, and um, uh, a necrotroph does not. It just kind of destroys the plant cells as it consumes the plant. Um, Botrytis is actually a bio is also uh, it's actually ha has both qualities, if I remember correctly. I think I put that in my video. So this pest primer series hashtag pest primer, I guess. Um, uh, that uh, I have a playlist that kind of goes over a bunch of different pests. I have uh, new ones that come out. I used to be doing it about weekly, but now it's a little. It's going to be a little bit. I'm going to ramp up and talk about a few more pests um, in the coming months. Now, uh, do you ever update some of the older information you've put out when, if anything new comes out that you've heard about? I plan to. I definitely talk about it when I can. However, I don't. The series is not old enough that that has been the case yet, to my knowledge. But Good to hear. Uh, when I do, but it's just new, you know. Uh, uh, but you're right, absolutely, that will happen. That will definitely happen. And I'm not like, like, luckily, the thing, the point of my videos is to convey knowledge and not to be like, I'm right about this topic. I don't have a vested interest in that. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and certainly, sometimes I feel like. There's definitely a few um, pest primers where I could have gone into more detail, but it's like at some point you you don't want to overcomplicate it. This is for cultivators for them to understand. I do use technical terminology, but I also try to break it down um, where I can. I usually try to include the pest uh, uh, scientific name, its most common common name, its locations around the earth. Um, if I can, uh, kind of a description of it, and also it's damp how it uh, how it like infests the plants, and then also ways to get rid of it um, <laughs> when possible. Um, and usually the treatment options are from a. Um, I try to be global about it, but it's just impossible to really consider every single country for me. Um, and it's free content, so like I try to do what I can, but obviously I can't do everything. Um, now, so we had another question, um, and it was more about russet mites because there's a lot of growers, California, Colorado, that battle russet mites. What's a good way we can really prevent, or if we start to get them to kind of fight them off and we're not losing so much of our crop? Mm, good. It's a good question. Um, 
Did, uh, it sounded like somebody else wanted to say something first. No, just good question. That's all. Oh yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah. Not so, everyone at once. <laughs> I did want to well, start get on get back on uh, yeah. powdery milky before we get too far. Okay. Um, um, could you show uh, Stabby's screen there? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, there you go. You go Stabby. Awesome. Okay. So one thing I wanted to talk about with uh, with, uh, with with the fungus on the leaves or the powdery mildew uh, on the leaves is if you see in this picture in the center here, you have the uh, conidia, which is the uh, reproductive bodies of the fungus. And then you have the mycelium. And then inside of the plant cell there where, where he's pointing is the hostorium and that's an actual that's basically a root that's penetrated the uh, cell wall and it's sitting in there just sapping up energy so this is what i'm talking about when i say if you wash your buds if you're just washing the stuff off the top of it there's still fungus inside of your buds this is why you got to throw away can't keep it don't smoke it. Don't smoke it. There's there's toxins in there, mycotoxins. You're you're asking for cancer. Now yeah, explain it. mycotoxins too. It's just what they what they produce to uh, to basically trick the plant and uh, break down whatever their food is. Mm. You know. And so like with like with like aspergillus mold, like when you get moldy bread, like that's really bad, and that can yeah. really really wreck you. Oh, yeah. um, and and so I mean like the other thing about mycotoxins is that one it's kind of a broad definition yeah. what they are and um, different fungi and different organisms different different fungi uh, produce mycotoxins and so it's not a very well studied subject as far as I understand it um, but you know I'm not like a you know I don't have a PhD in my in like mycotoxic mycology or, or, or biochemistry or anything like that but um, that's you been mine. I, I know. I'm sorry. Um, but I don't have, but I, so because of that reason, perhaps most importantly, I would err on the side of caution. Yeah. And if you're, you know, like, I mean, it's like in agriculture, you don't sell like, you don't sell like powdery mildew, moldy uh, flowers. You don't sell powdery mildew, moldy, like fruit. So like, you know, just keep at least that standard maybe. <laughs> Some people are right. If it's on your bud, it's <clears throat> inside your bud. Right. Just yeah. remember that, everybody. Well, yeah, I There's think a lot the of most people out there giving bad important. information. Yeah, the most important part of IPM is catching it before you have any sort of outbreak, whether that mm. be PM or pest or whatever, is inspecting your plants daily. You know, oh, it's, yeah. It's not on autopilot. Even if you've got drip irrigation and everything, like take some care take some time enjoy your plants like just take some time to look under the leaves look on top move the branches around you're not going to break them you're not going to hurt them even if you do have the grafting tape in you know you'll be fine and that and, uh, honestly i think we've gotten back to that plant pyramid where you, you, you the plant is still going to have some trouble if you don't take care of it but if that plant is like a trained boxer like it's eating as well as it possibly can it works out every day it has well, yeah no like if you've got life, everything it just shakes that shit off yeah and your room is sealed and stuff and like or, you know like you can there's ways to prevent the introduction of a problem to begin with you know there's or even that the plant will it shake way. it off a lot of times yeah yeah see that's the direction i go is like I, I got off all the bottled leaves and stuff like that. The only thing I add now is like a little bit of C90, you know, my microbes and uh, some amino acids once in a while, some left-handed amino acids to try to help uh, chelate some calcium. And, uh, you know, that I, I like using left-handed amino acids uh, when I'm producing seeds too. So uh, I have a – I definitely – I 100% agree with that about keeping your plant like – fit physiologically um if you have like a prevent so somebody asked earlier about russet mites so i will i will segue into both and answer both of these um for I example if, i got a question if, yeah <laughs> That's not a yes, question. are you smoking on anything tonight you dabbing i'm not i am not dabbing um 
Uh, yeah, go on ahead and join the smoke. Something flavorful. I think I got. Something. I'm about to smoke a bowl of uh, Tree of Life now that you mention it. Tree of Life, eh? Hey? Yeah. Honest, Roberts Creek, Congo. I saw a cat had some pretty good shit they're smoking on tonight. <clears throat> I'm smoking on some so, lemon meringue. Can anyone uh, identify this little fun guy? Morsel. No idea. Diaper crossed with raw cookies. <laughs> 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 Am I right? No. Is this the yellow yeah. parasol mushroom? Uh, this these have been popping up out of my bed every day this week, and it'll be dead by the time I get home from work. I have I'd have to see it like more like yeah. um, more 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 uh, more advanced, but a very common uh, mushroom that grows in like potted soil and and other places is um oh I, I don't usually I'm good with the binomial names, but I I will not try this one. It's the yellow parasol mushroom, and you can look it up if you want. <laughs> but uh, I I can't quite tell to be honest. Yeah, it hadn't op it hadn't opened yet, but uh, you know they they open up and then I don't know they must be within hours of opening that they're drying up and falling over. You know, yeah, that happens a lot with, with those mushrooms too. I think because um, they usually like really moist substrate, but like in a cultivation space, you kind of like. They grow so fast, so like I've got blue mat drippers, and these are popping up right next, to, you know, like within range of the dripper. So that makes they're, sense. Yeah, they're right there. And uh, uh, I've been having problems identifying this actually, and you're the perfect person to ask. Um, Can we finish the rusted mite deal real quick, Stabby? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, <laughs> so with the rusted, so with it's okay. So with the rusted mites. Um, so I'm talking about plant physiology and like having plants like bounce back when they're re when they're really, really fit and all of the uh, effects that you do to, to make that happen. Um, so if you get like a recent mite infection infestation, first of all, how you would try to avert that is you would want to have, in my opinion, the best way to do that is to have um, predatory mites like Amblyseus swirskii, which is a type three B uh, phytoseed or um, that's the largest group of the largest family of um, predatory mites that are commercially available. And uh, the thing about Swirskii is that they feed on a whole range of pests, actually. And so if you have a plant that's really healthy, um, and then you have uh, like a, a, a brigade of predatory mites just like walking around maybe you've companion planted with some with some pepper plants maybe they produce a bunch of pollen swirsky i can feed from nymph all the way exactly to what i do <laughs> i have poblanos and uh uh manzanos sorry i'm so bad at interrupting it's okay somebody somebody's mic is open with like and they're sitting next to the highway or something. I don't know. <laughs> Might be me. Basically, uh, if you have a really physically fit plant, then like it'll retard the development of a pathogen or a pest, which is great. And then combine that with your preventative bugs or whatever, then you can have like it's basically like a double whammy. The plants that's like to use an analogy, like it's like they're it's a fortress and then a well-stocked army, like. It's just not, you know, that, that little russet mite cell is going to be uh, combat ineffective. So what happens if I already have them? How can I start fighting to keep my plant alive and then not take it over? Or there is are, it even possible? It is. So you could use, um, <clears throat> you could try to use more predatory mites than like a, like a sachet system might have uh, for prevention. Um, for example, you could order those. You could also, um, if you're, so like some people try to say that they could burn sulfur. You should not burn sulfur. Um, and if you're in the United States of America, it's not. Never around cannabis. Yeah. That, fe that practice fell out, that fell out of practice like a long time ago. Um, 
for agriculture. So, well, but I also I'm living in California, and California is very very stringent about pesticide safety. How do you feel about micronized sulfur sprays, though? I like them. Yeah. I think in that, veg. I think in yes, in, in veg. Um, what what's uh, well? I guess there's you know somebody can buy the bottle and read the bottle, and then there's a bunch of different ones. I've, yeah, I've got the micronized powder. Different states will have different um, like regulations about what you can and can't do. So, like in different provinces around the world. So, um, at some places you can't. And this is what I was I meant with like my videos, like with my pest primer series. Like certain places you can still use like malathion and a lot of the things that over here we would never ever allow anymore. Um, so that kind of stuff, like. And some pests, some products, there's like no alternative, but like really nasty stuff, unfortunately, which is why we should put more research into the USDA and into like looking for um, natural enemies and microbes and that kind of stuff, you know, in my opinion. 710, what do you have to say about some of that in the rest of my, in your opinion? Like, what have you dealt with? Have you dealt with any of that? I haven't dealt with russet mites, thank science. Uh, like, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a professional on with uh, entomology. I'm, I'm a student. Uh, I, from what I know, you basically want to take at, took it from a couple different angles. If you're infested, the best way to go at it is generally, if you're infested, is sprays. Uh, that's generally what's happening in in the industry right now. Uh, especially in, in vegetative states, but not flowering states, of course. Uh, then if that happens, then you got to build up your your beneficials immediately after that to to stop a, another another wave from coming in, right? He's absolutely you're absolutely right as far as you know that's that is sort of the thing. like if you're going to use a sulfur spray, sulfur is fungicidal, insecticidal, and mitocidal. Um, and so that's why it works really well against resimites. Any, any kind of thing that you're going to be using on arthropods to eliminate them, uh, you, you're also going to ha cause damage to your beneficials, and it's always best to be prepared and, and re-inoculate after you use anything. But well, it depends. It technically, depends. it depends on the target. Yeah, and what well, the chemistry is, but you know, a lot of a lot of pesticides that are insecticidal against a certain group, you know, may have sublethal effects. Um, yeah. Famously, I'll, there is a pest. I'll what? bump up my population. Uh, you know, I'll like uh, order more ladybugs or whatever. You know, even though yeah. it doesn't harm the ladybugs, but I'll just bump up my population of beneficials after even uh, doing. Uh, like soybean oil sprays and stuff like that. Like, I don't know. I just try to always stay ahead of any kind of. Uh, uh, but, Stabby, that's the difference. In Colorado, you can't really. It's hard to fight russet mites, especially growing out. Oh, well, yeah. Ladybug going and target russet mites. They're, yeah. They're too small. No, once you have once you have the russet mite infection, you're you're out of luck for beneficials. They, the the uh, russet mites reproduce too quickly, and the uh, the beneficials don't reproduce quickly enough, frankly, to, to eat them. They don't eat enough of them to basically counteract the reproduction. That's the idea. Man, that's I don't remember when spider mites was it, the worst. I thing would we say had. it depends on how bad the population is. I would say that's why the crop scouting is very important. I would say that if you buy enough predatory mites quick enough and you can acquire them and you catch the infestation early enough, you do have a chance. And I've seen it happen myself, but I will say that a lot of people don't have that time. And a lot of, and sometimes you just miss them because they're 200 microns long. And so I, another thing I want to say is that, um, not that anyone was saying this, but I really hate it. Don't you guys hate it when people think that when people say things like you must be a bad grower if you get pests, like that's another thing. Right. Like, it's kind of, you know, it's like, oh, all right, like, everybody can get problems. <laughs> anyone can get problems, you know? Um, but uh, I will say that beneficials do work slower than um, like a sulfur spray. <laughs> That's for sure. Now you were yeah, you want to be ahead of the game with beneficials. You want to be way ahead of the game. With beneficials. Yes, absolutely. If you can do it, Matthew, yeah. you were naming the beneficials that kind of eat on russet mites. What were those again? 
<laughs> right. So, um, well, I had just mentioned Amblyseus Swirskii, and the reason why I prefer that one. So, like, there are examples. So, there's no academic literature that that um, uh, actually states that Amblyseus Swirskii is an effective um, biocontrol, to my knowledge, and you know, at, at, at the as of the recording of this video. Um, but uh, uh, there are examples. So, Aculops cannabicola is the hemp russet mite. Russet mites are specialists. So, um, uh, we've talked to Jeremy a few times, or Andrew at uh, Biotactics, and he says that Oxidentalis. Oxidentalis, yeah. The best for russet mites. Do you know anything about those compared to that? Are you saying you like the what's the ones you just said? Skellies? Oh, the Swirsky eye. Swirskies. Yeah. So you like the Swirskies over the Ocidentalis? Yeah. Um, so like like I said, um, I'm not aware of any academic literature that uh, concerns um, either Swirsky eye or Occidentalis, actually. Now that doesn't mean so like so that goes that gets to my point. What I was what I was gonna say. There are other predatory mites that do affect um, Russet mites, and it depends on again your context. Certain predatory mites do better in certain environments, um, but they all they have a pretty wide overlap with each other. I would say. Um, so I had a major russet mite outbreak in one of my outdoor gardens, and I caught it early enough, and I nice. did the biotactics to the Austin Talus, and I bought like a thousand dollars worth of bugs, man. And it seemed like I had to keep buying bugs. Like it didn't really, it <laughs> kind of stalled the problem out, but didn't like solve it. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there could be a lot of things going on with that. So for one, um, it could be, I'm not going to say that uh, this is in no way an insinuation against anyone or any company or anything, but sometimes in transit with biocontrols, uh, no matter who it is, sometimes like the the predators aren't as alive as they should be, or because of packaging, or um, especially the weather being so terrible in certain places. Like the the mail just doesn't go through the way that it should, because these are living organisms, and when they're sent over the mail, sometimes there there is difficulty with that. So my point is that it's always important to quality control or quality check your product. Uh, before you apply it. Now that's not that's not supposed to be a cop out answer. There's a ton of other things that could be happening. For example, um, if the pop, you know, you have to kind of match the amount that you're putting out uh, to the amount of russet mites there are, and mm. uh, you know, it's, it gets a little bit complex. I'm not trying to like be circuitous. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to be. Um, I just know that. I've been on so many sides of it where it was quality check or like I was, I was uh, in a situation where um, a different biocontrol company had sent over Californicus um, for roses for the, for the uh, protection of roses against two spot spider mite. And they were like all dead. We bought like so, so much money's worth. This was like 8.5 acres of, of um, roses or no, 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 this was like, for anyways my point is that you know we checked and we knew to check and we were able to get a refund and a bunch of other stuff but or they were able to send more and make sure the quality was good but sometimes that happens uh, i'm not it's not as uh, an excuse it's just that like there could be other things without being there and seeing everything that happened it's hard to say and just like just like there's pests that only feed on one type of plant or multiple types of plants, polyphagus or uh, monophagus, um, or reverse that for what I was previously saying, uh, there are predators that only specifically feed on like one family of uh, mite or one family of lepidopteran or something like that, right? So you really have to match your your pest with your uh, with your management. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, like, uh, so like with the phytoceids, phytoceidae, the predatory mites, they, they're a very, very smart man, um, big passion with the predatory mites of phytoceidae. Um, he classified them into like 
four different um, groups. And the type ones are very specialized against Tetranicidae, the, the spider mite family. And the type fours are very generalized. In fact, they mostly feed on pollen. Um, and then the type threes are a little bit more generalist and the type twos are a little bit more specialist with some other characteristics. So like there's a research report that people can look up or I can send anyone if they want it that kind of goes over that. And I have videos on my YouTube channel that do go over that. Um, so like I said earlier, that's the kind of stuff that I try to talk about on my, on my channel, things that are like esoteric or like kind of people don't have regular access to, but if you break it down, it's very helpful for cultivators, people who are trying to learn the biocontrol um, because a lot of times, and here's something that I kind of have an issue with is that most people get trained in my, in my experience, most people um, learn about beneficials through salespeople, through companies who have a vested interest in selling you a product. And I'm not trying to say that most, I mean, I'm not trying, I have a lot of friends in the biocontrol industry, but you got to, you got to consider that you always have to consider that as a consumer. Right. And, um, you also might find that like certain, certain companies like don't produce the, the, uh, the biocontrol that you want to get, or maybe they're having uh, shortages. So you have to go to a different biocontrol company or something like that. It's, um, it's a very complex sort of situation. Well, they're also very expensive. And I know that not all of our audience is going to be able to afford using beneficials. So um, That's true and I know that is your, your kind of, your, I don't know if you want to call it your specialty or not, but, um, you know, maybe we could talk about some more things like uh, common things that people can use, maybe even things that they can find around the house that they can use um, effectively to, uh, you know, uh, manage pests. So the number one thing like that, fire? Any, yeah, like fire, <laughs> like a trash can. <laughs> um, no, yeah, like soaps and um, you know even clove and stuff like that. Essential oils. Yeah, um, like you know, if I you wouldn't drop, recommend spraying yeah. just anything on, in your cupboard on your plants, but you know there are certain things if you know what to look for that you can use in a pinch. Mm -hmm. Or if you're on a super tight budget. Yeah. So, like, yeah, you could, like, draw a pentagram into the ground and you put, like, a <laughs> droplet of, of, like, lavender essential oil and all the on the pentacle. And then, um, then you have to chant in Latin backwards. And you might be able to summon a, a predatory, might like, spirit army instead of having to buy them from wherever. A lot less money and... Um, yeah, no. Uh, so, do they so have if you don't know Latin, Latin though, though, if, if you happen to not know Latin like some pleb, uh, yeah. what are some other suggestions? <laughs> that they so, so right. So um, you, you make a good point about biocontrols being very expensive. Um, not always. And I mean, like, but you're right. It's like if you can't afford it, then the usability is very is a very important aspect of that. And your resources are important. And if we're talking about a commercial grow, that's one thing. But if you're talking about by yourself, obviously. Um, uh, so one thing that people can do, uh, if they, for, for example, if they want to use biocontrols that they just won't be able to like find, um, commer uh, they won't be able to find them commercially because they're just naturally in the area and nobody cultivates them. They can like plant certain plants to encourage them to be around. Has anyone tried to do something like that? Kind of like a companion plant, bringing in like certain other pests that will help. Big advocate for biodiversity, even in your indoor gardens. Um, mm. Biodiversity is, is great in my opinion, whether it be cover crop or companion plants. Uh, I love to do basil. You have a um, it, it smells beautiful and it flowers and uh, I love to do uh, pepper plants as well. Um, you know, you harvest your peppers and they're, they're great. Uh, or whatever you, whatever you like, to, whatever works for you, you know. Um, well, I see some people that probably grow in smaller pots and it'd probably be super tough to do a companion plant in like a five gallon pot. It's easy to no, do you companion could, you plants next to them though. 
Yeah, you could plant them next to them. Talking like put aloe in the corner of my room. Um, not necessarily aloe yeah. as a well, not aloe, mint, mint, mint yeah. uh, basil, pepper. Lemongrass. Lemongrass was a good one too to put in. So a video that I have on my channel talks about um a, this, a few research reports that go over, and I mentioned this a little bit in passing earlier. Swirsky eye, for example. So if you didn't have the resources to buy as many as you wanted, but you were ahead of the game, you can spend uh, you know, a fraction of the amount of money that you might have spent before and buy some ornamental pepper plants. Hmm. And there's a research report that talks about how they're able to essentially um maintain like a colony of like twelve hundred. Amblycia swirskii per uh, ornamental pepper plant um, of a particular cultivar, and I believe it was um, exploding exploding ember. I think was the name. You can look up the video or something if you want, but uh, that kind of a thing could be helpful because you can just buy less uh, of the biocontrol agent if it's a generalist. If it feeds on the pollen, in that case, yes, then you can just apply okay. them. You can apply them and kind of establish them in your crop and they can like stay around a lot longer. And that that's one way you can kind of cut costs, especially in a in a really small uh, area. Like most biocontrol companies sell things in amounts that are going to be very useful for a cultivation facility professionally. Is it, is it in this yeah. one that I watched here? Yes, it is. Okay. So, so what about like like soil fungus gnats and how, how can people deal and combat some of that? It's always a common Is there problem. Is biology we can use to deal with some yeah. of those? A lot of us deal with fungus gnats or little, you know, uh, aphids that fly or, or whatever down in our soil. Uh, well, if, well, if you have root aphids, then then I would suggest the fire. Or like uh, the garbage <laughs> No, seriously. Yeah. Like yeah, a seriously. lot of people just can't. Like it won't. Like the root aphids might not kill your plant necessarily, but like, yeah, you'll if you never ever fucking want to get rid of them unless you cook that soil. That's right. an excellent point, actually. By the way, uh, I I think a lot of people don't realize how time-consuming some pest issues, pest and pathogen issues, can become, especially uh, if you don't have the resources, or even if you do. If you have a huge room, you have the same kind of problem that an amateur has, where like it consumes all your time and all your resources. It may not be worth it in those cases. Uh, I, I wonder what would those kinds of cases be for you, like where it's too bad. Yes, so um, it's absolutely. One second, damn time. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> smoke fast, everybody smoke it if you got it. <clears throat> so it's, it's, I will answer though uh, while everyone's enjoying themselves. Um, mm -hmm. They absolutely. So it's absolutely um, a legitimate strategy to um, be aggressive and um, and very like violence of like uh, uh, what's it called violence of action yeah so like that's why the crop scouting daily is so important if you hit it if you get something that's really bad and you only have a small population and you just don't want to risk it fucking put that thing in the garbage can like call it like put a bag over it make sure you don't try to like minimize um, you know, first try to find everywhere it is and then secondly just get rid of the whole thing um that's aggressive. It's not necessary always, but like, it's absolutely legitimate. Um, if you get something that's really pernicious, like root aphids or russet mites. Russet's the killer, man. Now, what about gnats? Like low fungus gnats that we get. What's one of the best ways to really combat them um, from overtaking our soils in our room? Um, I have a video on that too, but basically, um, it depends on how you're growing, but there are nematodes that are very, um, very useful against fungus snat larvae. Um, I've seen someone, I know that this is sort of contentious, but I've seen someone utilize like just putting a top layer of sand, um, in their like potted plants to like make it harder for the, um, female fungus nest to oviposit in the soil, but other people yes, have supposedly you know, they don't 
you know, they don't want to dig through that uh, material. Like people use that uh, net next to, which is like what broken glass reconstituted into stones or something. Diatomaceous earth. And... Uh, I think diatomaceous earth is about worthless unless you're putting it in a compost tea to try to attach microbes to all the surface area. I don't think it's very good IPM uh, mm -hmm. tool. Also, there's a research report that literally uh, assesses whether diatomaceous earth is effective against fungus gnats, and it came across as not being the case, at least in that study. Which I do reference in the video. All of my videos, by the way, unless otherwise stated, have academic sources in the descriptions so that people can, like, look for themselves. And I don't want anyone to ever take what I say necessarily at face value. Um, I try to always back up my statements when I can. Um, and see, that's the one thing I really liked about your channel is that you did provide the information so I can look myself and you were, you know, it's kind of like you were turning me on to it and here, here's where you can find it, you know, go do it yourself now type deal. I like that. I, I appreciate that. I really, I really appreciate that. I always look for constructive criticism, whether it's something I should do more of or less of that I have control over. Um, because I think it's really important, like you said, that people have access to that. Of course, part of the... Uh, part more of the, memes. More memes. Uh, more memes, yes. I agree with you, actually. I should definitely be incorporating more memes. Maybe I'll put like a... Maybe I'll put a pink guy reference in there. Uh, ah, yeah, <laughs> filthy Frank. Yeah, no, but specifically pink guy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we are we about done with the uh, fungus gnats and stuff? Because I actually I haven't watched these yet. What what's your take on uh, Bavaria bassiana? Because it's I, it's probably my favorite biocontrol agent. I just top dressed some this morning before I left for work. I just sprinkled some all over my bed. <laughs> Does it smell good? Does that have a smell? I don't know, man. I'm not sniffing that stuff. It's like a <laughs> cordyceps type mushroom. It is related to the cord. It is in the in the cord cord cordyceps family. Cordyceps. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't want any Bavaria bassiana fucking spores in my brain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that how um that's the, how the Last of Us, right? Or or is that yeah. a different? Oh, I don't yeah, know. After this, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's that's spoiler perfect. alert. Sorry, spoiler alert. If you haven't played. <laughs> to, oh, thanks. thanks. I've talking. never heard, even heard of it. I don't watch TV or movies or shit anymore. Stabby, seven ten. What were you saying? I just want to uh, just wanted to talk about fungus there. Yeah, they're. I mean, now they're they're developing, not developing, but searching for funguses, fungi, fungi, fungi that uh, that attack our our worst and uh, best pests. Um, there's a product out there that uh, I recently came across. I haven't tried it yet, but uh, it's called Met 52. Anybody can check it out. It's uh, it's fungal. I've heard of it. Yeah, it's uh, labeled for thrips, white flies, mites, ticks, and hairy that's chinch bugs. Very hard to come by. I actually tried to make that part of my super soil mix, mm -hmm. and dude, that wasn't easy to purchase. Where was it? Cheap. Maybe down here it's not available like it is up there for. Him in Canada, maybe is that and that's, and that's such an important thing. Again, that's why it's so important to consider. Like, I try to keep things as as general as possible, but yes, yeah, some places it's going to be more expensive or literally just not available. Right, that's what I mostly. It wasn't too expensive, I guess. I didn't really find it that. It was just it was hard to. Find. I don't know. I think one hundred and thirty-four fucking dollars for a <laughs> liter is pretty expensive to me. <laughs> it's a little bit on my price range. I what are you, peasant? It was literally a small package, like you could fit on your fucking like a paper, dude. But yeah, it was just hard to find a source. Here's yeah, another thing about that. pesticides. Here's another reason why it's a really good idea to go away from pesticides. Because from a commercial perspective, I've been working with uh, floriculture and traditional ag for about five years now. Um, or no, no, about nine years now. I'm sorry. And the thing about it is that pesticide costs go up every year. Like twelve, like something like, in some cases, as much as like 10% almost. Wow. So like, Why is that? Is it just uh, like usury, just kind of capitalism, or is it something else? Um, nice, nice, uh, 50 cent word there. Um, usury. It's, uh, it's kind of more like 
there's a lot of factors. Um, I, you know, I'm not a big, not a Monsanto shill, but, um, you know, there are restrictions. And so people, they just pass that off onto the consumer. So like the, like tariffs and taxes and things like that. Mm. Um, also like certain, so the, the constituents that you need to produce the, the product, um, like oils and, and other sorts of inert ingredients and whatever. Um, I'm not a physical chemist, but that kind of a thing can, those prices can increase. So then, you know, it's like if the price of flour increased, then, the, you know, the dough is going to increase as well. Right. And all that stuff, or it doesn't have to, but that's what happens. Well, I don't have any 50 cent words, but I can string together a bunch of uh, <laughs> two cent words, maybe 25 of them or so. And uh, we're going to do a giveaway here shortly. And um, uh, Tanazi will pick something to put in the chat, and I'll do the usual where I grab your names from the chat. I got you right here, everybody. Oh, people are mentioning me, and I am not paying attention. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't uh, know where I, I do have some went. I do have some shots to show off to from uh, from a little community over on uh, the late hangout. They were <laughs> kind enough to uh, share some of their their garden picks with me. Um, uh, got yerba buena, growing some uh, uh, sniper uh, raw cookies, and uh, here's another one. He's got a little DWC going on. Um, Fucking LV Fino has just been killing it. His uh, plants are looking awesome right now. Shout out to him. These are all these tall ones are all the uh, sniper cookies, and he's got another one here. Got a few more picks. Looking healthy, looking pretty good. He said that uh, he had a couple little hiccups with some. He just moved, wasn't used to the water or, or something where he was at. And uh, or over water, got a little bit of root rot on one of them, but it's it's uh, bounced back. It's a little stented though. And uh, shout out to everyone over there, uh, Lisa G. Um, uh, wow, I'm just blanking now. Ned Ned Denver, Ned Denver is going to be coming to the DGC Cup with us, um, mm -hmm. April thirteenth. If you're coming, get your tickets. I mean, I'm sure they're about out of them. Um, and you're going to want to make a reservation somewhere, something where we got a, um, a nice close Airbnb within walking distance. So we're going to be around, uh, all weekend, probably. Uh, How, do you often... to sleep? How many people are you going to invite over? <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to. Well, we got a three bedroom. Security so. deposits and stuff. But I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be trashing the place, but, uh, let's, let's do this giveaway. Uh, right. so what drop a hashtag ethos. or drop a start or hashtag in the chat and I'll, I'll pull up a okay, I'll start too. it with the embracing organic. I'm going to drop this in the chat. We're all doing a dab. <laughs> Boom. All right, go. Hashtag what? Stabby. Dab time. Hashtag dab time. <laughs> Uh, as soon as the dab time hashtag start rolling in, I'll, uh, I'll start taking down names here. I also want to, uh, give a shout out to, uh, Bazigo. I, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Bazigo, fucking awesome dude. Shows up, uh, Holy checks out the show every the week. Chat's going off. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Forget it. I'm not doing the same way. That's too many entries. <laughs> <laughs> you, that's what you wanted. No, no, I agreed. I I said I would do this, you know, for our fans every week. I said I would do it. I'm gonna. Do it, it is the challenge. I do say that. I tried it the other day. I'm yeah, just... man, it ain't it ain't easy. <laughs> this is oh yeah. Project. Name that pest, or is it even a pest? I can't tell. Could that yeah, be a rule beetle? Like, it looks like a springtail to me. I yeah. See, that's what Co mm -hmm. was saying that it was some sort of springtail, but it I, don't, I haven't seen him jumping, and I've. Provoke the shit out of them. They just move really fast. Believe like it or not, not yeah, I mean, it's. It, would you believe that not all he spring said that, Yeah, I know. He said this also that there's you know hundreds of varieties of springtails or something like that. 
Yeah. Uh, don't they say they make up the bulk of all animal mass on Earth is just like springtails? Yep. Yeah, I believe so. It's a pretty significant amount. If they, if they ever organize, we'll, we'll all be doing <laughs> We're all fucked. <laughs> yeah. Now, what were you saying, Matthew, about the springtails? Oh, I think I, re- I got my thought across. It was what you were saying. Like, okay. yeah, they don't, <laughs> uh, you know, they don't all, all spring. And um, uh, certainly they don't all look the same, all the columbola. All right. It's been a minute. <clears throat> we're done. Votes are in. You should have already entered. Go All right. Ahead, uh, but you should see my like little exclamation marks to separate it. Now, Tanasi, what pack of ethos are these? What seeds are these? Oh, yeah. We didn't say we were giving it away. We're just going to no. start out. So we have little GMO from ethos genetics. Is Does it say what the cross is? I have no idea. I, th- I guess you'd have to like check out online. These were given in a freebie pack that they were giving away at the Indo Expo. Little G. Oh, going. Yeah. Lucky winner, and it's uh. <clears throat> let's see. I think that's ten pack. Let's see. No, this is a five. Five pack. It must be special. So, why like, Stabby's getting all that down, Matthew? What's your opinion on like the breeding and the breeding industry, and not breeding for pest resistance or mold resistance in plants? Hmm. I think that we could do a lot better at uh, funding that, and I think that for a long time it was very difficult to do this because computerization wasn't there for genome sequencing as it is now is becoming more and more trivial to sequence genomes and also sequence the genomes of different microbes and the microbiome. And essentially, like I was saying before about how uh, plants have been dealing with microbes since time immemorial. And so the microbes can um, really unlock certain aspects of plant health but also resistance as well as um, the genetic interaction between pathogens and their host plants so now we can probably or rather we have been um, much more successful in finding what that is and then trying to breed for it Um, for some pathogens however like i was saying um, a good example, I think, is a, uh, is it a, I forget, it's a fusarial pathotype, but basically it's what wiped out a bunch of the bananas, you know, the banana story. Um, and so um, that, uh, so, this, this, so they were able to make cultivars that were resistant. However, that resistance, that, the things that changed, that conferred resistance to the fusarium, uh, then made it more susceptible to, to a different pathogen that's almost as abundant. So you were trying to talk about that earlier, yeah. Yeah. So it's so I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, that research it's been going in some interesting directions, but I am way more happy with our current ability to try to f- suss out the details and then trying to read for the uh, the solution. And there's also some uh, research, let me see if I can say this correctly, using pathogens to uh, not just induce systemic resistance, but to specifically target a terpene response. Fuck, I don't even know how to express this. It sounded Purpose- pretty cogent. <laughs> I'm a little bit high. I've had a few dabs. So uh, uh, they were talking about this on the Dude Grow Show the other day. Like uh, they were hinting the mammoth microbes people using microbes to induce specific growth patterns or even specific uh, pest resistance or whatever else. So they would essentially, I guess, use a bacteria to make a bug uh, to make a plant resistant to russet mites, for example. Uh, do you know anything about so that? So you're kind talking of stuff? genetically modifying it in a sense. Do you mean like with agrobacterium specifically? Essentially, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so agrobacterium. So, ag- agrobacterium tumefaciens is related to 
Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know any specific species. I thought you were just talking about agrobacteria. See, that's how how much of lay people we are. We didn't realize that, that was an actual species. <laughs> but it does sound like a but it does sound like a term, doesn't it? That right, that's right. up too. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, well, it does segue, but I think I think um, some somebody was going to mention probably what I was going to say. But yes, um, uh, yeah, there are. Oh yeah, that brilliant thing. I was just about to say it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Somebody else was. was but you go the ahead. Words you, out of my you, mouth. Yeah. Sorry. You go ahead. You go yeah, ahead. No, no problem. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm not so uh, clairvoyant. I um. So so yeah. So if it was so with Acrobacterium specifically, the way that it um, parasitizes a plant is it creates a gall. But by doing so, it is able to insert DNA. Um, or, or, or insert a, plas- a plasmid that uh, makes the cells produce uh, certain compounds that it feeds on as well. Um, this is also, by the way, how diazotrophs um, and rhizobia that like colonize the roots of legumes to make to like fix nitrogen. That's how that happens. Uh, it's the same process. It's a very similar process, you should say. And in fact, Agrobacterium tumefaciens is considered a pathogen usually, uh, but it's very much related to beneficial microbes or organisms that we would consider beneficial, like the example I gave uh, before. So um, does that, is that related to the question kind of? So, so basically- I, We're high st- enough that we'll just all assume that it was a wonderful answer. I, I think so. I think we did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not even sure if I was able to phrase the question in a logical I actually, way. So. Can you say the question I again? You. I don't think I got it. Honestly, yeah, I, exactly. I, I applaud you internet. for making an effort. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I really, I genuinely want to hear what you said, if you can remember Well, it. it's just, it's, I guess, the cutting edge of all this stuff. And it, I, there is, I think, probably a huge uh, genetically modified component to it. But I guess the mammoth people specific, I don't, I don't know anything about that. I just saw this on TV the other on YouTube, that they're developing uh, 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 microbes that will work synergistically with the plants to accomplish specific tasks. And I know that there are other companies working on stuff like that, both GMO and through just selection to, mm-hmm. to find different species that will, again, I guess, synergistically, even, even if they're using some kind of an attack pathway, I don't remember the word you were using it earlier, uh, sure. to trick a plant to do something that they want. Whew. Yes. Okay. So yes, um, that is not what I said. But now that I've heard your question again, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. <clears throat> and the, I guess the answer is that, yes, such, such things exist. And you, uh, for example, certain, certain beneficial microbes and certain mycorrhizal fungi, for example, um, they have a tough time colonizing the plant's ry- uh, rhizoplane uh, with the, when the plant's not stressed. And there are a few reasons for that, and some of that's genetic that certain um, stressors pu- uh, put out certain metabolites, for example, in the root exudent that allow free living microbes to like detect it and then go to the plant and then try to inoculate it or just exist on the rhizoplane on the root surface. Um, and yes, there is a genetic component to um, like ingress, like endophytic movement from outside of the plant to inside of the plant um pathogens obviously have to have a way to do this and a lot of times the way that beneficials do it and the way that path- pathogens do it uh is often practically identical not always though it depends um yeah I guess so you could maybe- almost uh, in on some level i don't know i guess i'm breaking this down into a stoner brain uh you could on some level crowd out like a the same way that you use probiotics or something, you would probiotically create a virus that will just block a hypothetically, I'm just completely making this up out of nowhere, a virus that will block some kind of a bug or a pathogen just physically by, by being there and, and occupying that space. Is that what you're trying to get to? That's one example. For example, there are uh, RNA or RNA interference um, viruses that are very, very specific to certain species of um, butterflies for example hmm. and i've made and i have examples in some of my videos for certain uh, moth species uh, there are ways that you can there, there are people who have been able to develop the virus and then use it in a spray to kill the virus because it's contact kill basically once the or once the pest uh, larva eats the leaf tissue yeah. 
it ingests it and then it it uh, multiplies and then it kills the um the organism but it's very host specific so you don't have the same problem of potentially killing another um like beneficial or uh, just by making like physical contact with it or something bacillus uh, well this this is a virus but there are also like other compound other uh, microbes to be sure yeah, well, I mean, I know BT is commonly used for uh, for lepidopterans, uh, for for moths, uh, butterflies, um, especially up here in, in uh, British Columbia. Uh, they have a couple problems with a couple specific species of uh, tree borers, and uh, yeah, they're they're using the BT sprays. All right, guys, I love it all. I love it. Here we go for this fucking. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna the randomize the names. If and, we can all uh, scan through Stabby's list here. Uh, three times random. Okay. Good luck, Red everybody. Hold that thought, Number one. Rigged. Hold that thought. Rigged. Yeah. Frigged. So you can pause the stream if you really care about where your numbers at. I'm scrolling down a pretty slow. We got 49 people in the machine tonight. Gonna start it here in about ten seconds. All right. All right. Go ahead, Matt, and say go. It's your special guy. <laughs> go. We're gonna do number seven down tonight. <laughs> oh, I froze because I hit the wrong button. <laughs> number seven. All right, seven ten. What were you saying now? Why the balls are dropping? Uh, oh, I was just talking about uh, BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, that's that's um, when you whenever you hear about uh, BT corn or uh, transgenic corn, that's one that's one of the major uh, things they've worked with is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. You get them in those uh, those mosquito pox. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you throw them the uh, mosquito bits and the mosquito dumps. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there's speci there's many types of Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, well, Bacillus specifically, but yeah. uh, a couple of them attack specifically mosquitoes. Some of them attack specifically uh, uh, moths or uh, or butterflies. And uh, yeah, I don't know exactly I where had, I was going with that, but <laughs> gnats uh, once upon a time, and I put a. Mosquito dunk in my res that feeds my blue mats, and no more gnats. Yeah. I guess the reason why a lot of those dunks don't work is because the, the concentrations are not adequate for the evolved resistance. I guess the mosquito, uh, the, the, the fungus gnats have evolved some resistance to the bug, but not enough for higher concentrations. At least that's what I was told by a, like a bug expert here. Whatever. I left that dunk in there until it sunk. Nice. So, like, I left it in there until it was totally saturated because they come, like, so dry that they're almost hydrophobic. Hmm, and, like, yeah, at first, true. only the bottom side of it will actually get, uh, like, like swell up. I have so a question. I just left do, it you in there agi it do you agitate when you do that? Um, I mean, my room was, like, running really hot at the time. So I was adding, like, five gallons to the res every day. So mm -hmm. I guess you could say I was agitating when I was dumping no, I the water. You, you were dunking but not constantly. No. Okay. Yeah. That might increase your efficacy. Yeah. I thought. See, I did buy. Um, I actually bought like a filter for an aquarium, and I was gonna put that in my res. Hey, we got to keep it clean. Abby. But then uh, I ended up putting the dunk in there anyway. So I was like, oh, I'm not gonna ruin the filter. Number 26. Is that seven? Congratulations, 26. I think. See, number 20. Is it? I can't it is it. number 26. Sir Sticky. Congratulations, Sir Sticky. Somebody's got some fire. What was that? Ethos what again? Ethos Little GMO. Ooh. I don't want to see. It's garlic, like mushroom, garlic, mushroom, and onion. onion. Oh, that's definitely 28. Look. 
twenty six. It's a really a nice cross. If anyone's, uh, if people have never had it, it's really if you get the. Uh, I guess there's a bunch of different finos. There's some more like oniony, some more mushroomy, but it really does taste like garlic, mushroom, and onions. And it's like if you get the right cut, it will be a little bit like on the inhale, and then as you taste it, the exhale is different flavors. It's really a trip. Ah, I got the. Uh... I've always wanted to try. It. I've never tried. I mean, you know, I uh, I live. It's a hype strain, but it's it's it can be good. It can be worth. I, it. I live in a land far, far away <laughs> from a dispensary, so like, there's mm. a lot of shit that I've never had. And you know, like when I was still getting stuff from a plug, it was like, everything was Girl Scout cookies. You know what I mean? No matter what color it was, no matter you know what it was, it was it was Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So cookie it, fam. Uh, well, just that's that's what the hype was, you know. That's mm-hmm. what the fucking hype was. So that's what every, uh, you know, everyone supposedly had, or you know what they said they had, because that was the fucking hype. And you never really know what you're getting when you're when you're, um, you know, uh, buying it on the gray market. I don't know. That's that's part of the reason why I started uh, growing for myself was because, uh, uh, it, yeah, options being out for me, I try to do right. it the best way possible. Tanasi, how does uh, Sticky get a hold of you? Uh, I've been posting the email in there. It's embracing organic show at gmail dot com. Email us your info, brother, and I'll get them out to you next week, man. Bo show. Congrats, Sticky. And thank you, Matthew, for coming on to the show. Really yeah. appreciate you coming on and putting out the knowledge you did. And 710, you know, appreciate both you guys really putting out the information you two are. So I appreciate you, buddy. Uh, you know, fuck that 710 guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, yeah. I know he's Canadian, man. Fuck that Canadian. You know, what did he ever do for me? <laughs> Yeah, guys, you guys blew my mind tonight, dude. I was in awe of all the like. There's so much shit I don't even know about, like that side of pesticides. So I'm just, I'm just so against bugs. Fucking spray some method one. <laughs> yeah, if it's super hardcore, dude, you gotta use some fucking something with some uh, spinach or uh, azimac or something like that. Something I wish like we could have got more into sprays tonight because, like, I recommend having an IPM management system that works well together because like some sprays Mm -hmm. you can't follow each other with, you know, like you don't want to be using a sulfur and then an oil and then Mm. a fucking, Oh yeah. uh, You know, all this shit in like the same (laughs) week. Okay. You're just going to fry your plants. Citric acid and oil is a bad combo. Yeah. But you can take little steps and do certain things. Um, Like I was was going to ask. Before we go, there's one more before we go. I I had a really curious uh, like proposition or theory. Like I know higher pH water can supposedly um, kill uh, PM or at least take care of it on the leaf surface, or you know can it it can help in some ways. Can you oxygenate water enough to raise the pH enough to use it in that way? I've never even you, you're trying to make it alkaline, Stabby. Exactly. How are you gonna oxygenate it enough to make it alkaline? Well when you when you oxygenate yeah. the water, the the pH goes up. Maybe you know? some testing you'd have to pull because I've never even tried pulling pH and even cared about to even check it or anything like that. But yeah, using things like soaps, essential oils, uh using emulsifier, emulsifier is like a soap or ag sill, use essential oils like clove. Uh, I mean, build a soil has an awesome blend. Uh, I use that stuff; it works great. Um, yeah, you can use some Dr. Bronner soap. Um, use some fucking water. Spray some water on your plants. Knock some of those pests off. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do without spending an inordinate amount of money and driving up the cost of your your grow. That's all for another set or another show, Stabby. That's all for another show. <laughs> We're going to definitely, definitely can talk about some organic spraying for sure. 
But uh, yeah, and uh, everybody have a good weekend. And I hope everybody had a good equinox. Check out the late hangout too. Check out the late hangout after this. You have a bro off. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks again, Matthew. Yo, anytime. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Matthew. Good talking, mm-hmm. bro. I don't. Peace out, everybody. I'm